Okay, so DeFi is the hottest new topic in blockchains the past for the past uh, at least the entire winter time here. Um, it's probably been around a couple of years as more and more applications have started to come online that use um, a blockchain protocol or a blockchain network. But it's really reached a tipping point basically kind of in June, July, and August uh, in, terms, in terms of it being like a, like a viral hit where a lot of people want to get into it and find out what it is. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about today. So we'll back up a second here. If we're talking about uh, decentralized finance, we want to be able to answer the question, uh, what is finance? And by finance, I mean the centralized version. So you may have an idea of what finance is. I'm going to give you my definition of what finance is. Um, and it's not a rigorous academic definition. Uh, I'm not an economist uh, or I didn't, I didn't study business even. Um, but through studying the blockchain, I have studied a lot of applications to economics and motivation behind why it's such a good idea. So I guess basically I wanted to write this down in just one bullet point here. I've got it's the business of money. All right. So you might think that finance and business are the same. Well, not necessarily business is kind of like all of you have kind of described a business case uh, or there is a business behind your project case um, and your business may be using the financial system, but it may not necessarily be in finance itself. So finance is kind of a subset of business. And I put here even or even science, but really maybe what I want to do here is say that this is mathematics um, of, of money. So science doesn't really necessarily apply to money, but if you start digging into some financial products, you might think like, oh, Jesus, this looks pretty crazy. Um, and if you start talking to people that are in finance, they may actually have backgrounds in science, like physics and mathematics. Uh, so it can get pretty complicated. Um, we're not going to talk about that because this is about uh, this is about DeFi and blockchains. Okay, so if you think about why you would need finance, think about how do big things get done. Uh, so big things require big money. So I'll give you an example of a small thing, which I might talk about more as we go. Is that I'm looking to buy a car, and so I'm presently shopping for loans from various providers in order to finance my car. So that's a financial product is a loan from a bank. But that's not what I talk about by, by big things. If you talk about um, building, we hear lots of construction right now, right? If you talk about building, is it that way? WZ, the new building, right? That's a big thing. Uh, the cost was somewhere around $160 million, right? So AUT doesn't write a check for $160 million and give it to your builder friend, right? AUT uh, has to go finance the process and they would provide some upfront collateral, likely locked into buildings they own, um, students they have coming in representing cash flow, all sorts of different things. Uh, and then they would be able to finance the purchase and there'd be a lot of stipulations there that you have to uh, have a certain amount built by this date and you have to you know, pay a certain amount um, uh, and you have to go shopping for your uh, your contracts and you can't you know you can't have any you, or you shouldn't have any like insider trading with who's getting the contracts of the building and and all sorts of things like this so that's kind of like a medium big thing and of course it can get much much bigger uh, and that's what someone that is in finance is probably doing they're probably talking about financing big things or just dealing with money itself and, and moving money around Okay, so even civilians need common financial services, so the smaller things. Uh, so here are some examples I just looked up this weekend. Uh, so credit cards, you can get one. You don't have to pay anything to get one, but you do have to pay interest on your purchases. So you're 14% for a Kiwi Bank zero fee card. And if you want to pay lower, you can get cards down to like 9%, but you have to pay for them. So you have to pay a fee in there. Uh, 
Loans, ASB will give you a personal loan at 12.95%. Uh, insurance, this is another financial product, uh, which may or may not be run by the banks, but it's still a financial product, right, where you pay for a service, and then if you need to, the bank will then pay you back for some insurance claim, right? So it's all about just money moving around. Um, car insurance for... Uh, car insurance for like a reliable small car is maybe $40 a month. Uh, then it goes up from there. Uh, another product is exchanges. So this is quite common. You need to go to your home country or you need to go on vacation and you need to use the local currency. So you have to go to someone. You have to pay for a service for someone to change your currency. Uh, so here's an example here between the buy and the sell. So at A and Z, you can buy for 65.8 cents. Okay, but then when you sell it, you don't get 65.8 cents back, right? You get 68.4 cents back, and A and Z keeps that spread. And that's actually pretty small. If you go to someone at the airport or you go to a dude in the back alley, he's going to charge you a bigger spread to swap your dollars. Uh, so that's a financial product. Uh, and then... Down the bottom end here, interest on bank deposits. So I'm going to take a segue here and talk about this. So uh, you deposit your money and you leave it at the bank or you get paid uh, from your job and your paycheck goes into your bank. Uh, the bank may pay you interest, which means they may pay you uh, an incentive to keep your money there. So BNZ has this new product. It's called Rapid Save, right? Yes, I can rapidly save my money. Um, get rewarded for sticking to your goals. Well, this looks fantastic. Um, and then you look here and you're like, what, what is this? So this is how much they're going to pay you. They're going to pay you half a percent per year. Okay, PA is per annum. Which really means they're going to pay you 0.1% on your money. And then if you don't have, what does it say? If you don't have too many withdrawals per month, okay, then you're going to earn a bonus 0.4%. Right? These are hilariously small numbers. If you have $1,000 in your bank account and you want to save it uh, and have it you know, working for you, um, this rapid save is going to save you. Well, if you, if you don't withdraw anything, it's going to save you or it's going to earn you 0.5%. So that's $5. So next year you'll have $1,005. Okay. Right. Like uh, this is hilarious. And like, look how happy she is. She's circled the day next year where she's earned five dollars. Like this is this is insane. Now the real kicker here is that if you withdraw from the account twice per month, that withdrawal costs you three dollars. Okay, so take our example here. You're saving a thousand. Next year you have a thousand and five. But uh oh, I withdrawed one extra time. They take three dollars as a fee straight off the top. So you're down to a thousand and two dollars. If you withdraw two extra times, now you're losing money. On their product because of withdrawal fees, um, and th and this is this is like the bank thinks this is a good product that they're advertising to people. People see this and they think, oh yeah, rapid save, like a good thing. Okay, um, so that and this really grinds my gears. You're, you're talking about the banks. Uh, this really grinds my gears. Okay, so what are the banks all about? Right, these financial activities. So who's profiting from them? So we've got A and A and Z, which I talked about with their money. Uh, exchange service there. So they made a billion dollars in 2019. That's that's profit. That's not revenue, right? So that's after expenses. Uh, and I'm sure you know this. Banks are very, very profitable. IAG, that's the Insurance uh, Insurance Australia Group. They made over a billion dollars. ASB, <laughs> they made $1.2 billion. Okay. And ASB, uh, they only operate in New Zealand, right? Small country, 5 million people, and one bank still made 1.2 million. Now, all of these numbers have come down a bit because of Corona, but they're still going to be profitable this year. Uh, BNZ, half a billion, and then poor little Kiwi Bank only made 100 million last year. Um, and that's because Kiwi Bank is state-owned by uh, the, the New Zealand government. Uh, so Kiwi Bank and NZ Post are... Uh, state corporations, uh, and so they're not out for profit the same way as much as, as the other banks, right? So what am I getting at here? It's that obviously 
If you want to make money, you should be a banker and you should not study computer science. All right. Uh, but basically, there's an opportunity here, okay? Because of all this profit, because of this bottom line, there's an opportunity in the market for somebody to come in and take some of that profit by taking customers, right? This is how business works. Uh, if you can take a customer away from somebody else and take that profit, then that business will reduce their profit, right? If uh, A and Z had no customers, then they wouldn't have any profit. I mean, they might still find a way to move some money around and earn some money, but they wouldn't have nearly as much if they didn't have any customers. And basically the customers we're not talking about are you and I. The customers are like AUT for financing their new builds and things like this. Okay, so if there's an opportunity here because there's so much profit, um, let's think about, first of all, why do we need the banks? So why do you why do you need a bank? Anyone wanna? Oh, do, you, do you trust the bank? You're you're right. The, the, you're supposed to trust them, right? So you need the bank because you trust them. And what do you trust them with? Your money. Yeah. So at least in my lifetime and my parents' lifetime maybe even your grandparents' lifetime, we've used a bank to hold our money and trust them to hold it safely. So if you give them $1,000, you can go there and collect your $1,000 or maybe more um, uh, if you're lucky. But not too long ago, that wasn't the case. So not too many generations ago, um, people had to do other things to store their money. And of course, you might hear, hear tales in like Hollywood or even from family members that have been through wars and things like this about what they had to do to preserve their money, okay? So in modern times, absolutely, we trust the banks and that's um, that's why we need them. Um, and another thing is that if you give them $1,000, you trust that they're going to return all of it and not just some of it, okay? So I might just write this down just these keywords, trust, and I've got another word here, resilience. Okay, so by resilience, we mean that you can come back next year, A and Z will still be operating, and they will still be able to offer you services. Um, but if we, if we take these two keywords here, right, this should remind us, going back to week one, this should remind us about the uh, motivation behind using a blockchain, right? What are some of the features that we like about blockchains? Well, Sometimes they're called trustless. Okay, well that, it's kind of an oxymoron, but it means that you can trust the blockchain without trusting somebody else. So you can trust that that design that you've written to the blockchain, um, okay, is going to be authored by that designer and not by somebody else. And you don't need to, you don't need to ring up anybody to verify it. You know, you don't need to call it. Uh, uh, a and Z uh, and go see a banker. Uh, so we've got this trustless characteristic of the blockchain and that fits in exactly to why we need why we need banks because we trust them. Well, it turns out you can also trust um, a blockchain platform, at least theoretically, there are uh, some holes in practice with that. Uh, and then resilience, right? So um, in the early days of banks, banks would shut down um, and you may not be able to go withdraw your money if, a, if an independent smaller bank were to shut down. Now, because of uh, the global nature of the economy, most banks have been swallowed and merged. And for example, HSBC, I think that's the world's biggest bank. Uh, you can go to an HSBC pretty much in any city on earth. All right. And now that's extreme resilience in terms of banking and have banking services uh, from that. But there are downsides that come with that as well. Um, so the opportunity here, not only is there profit, but there's a big crossover here between these two reasons of why we need the bank. So we also need the bank to provide us all those services, right? I need the bank to go get my car loan so that I can get a car uh, uh, and drive around, I guess, or whatever, right? All right, you need, you need the bank to be able to 
finance your student loan so that you can come to AUT, get a degree, earn money, support your family, retire happy, right? It's kind of, it's kind of built into the system that we have. Um, but I am going to argue that DeFi is kind of changing this. So let's look at two examples. So the first one is going to be interest and loans. Okay. So I'm just going to draw one easy diagram here. Okay. So here's my bank. Here are my customers. And what they're going to do is they're going to deposit their money into the bank. Pretty straightforward, right? And then the bank is going to build up all of these deposits that they have. and uh, they're not going to sit on them. They're going to want to go earn some money, right? The people that work at the bank, uh, they need to pay for their cars and their school as well. Uh, the bank needs to pay for this fancy building that it's in. They need to pay for all those ATMs and points of sales. So they need to earn their money too, and that's fine. So the bank is then going to turn around and L O A N, turn around and give the money to other people. Right, so this is, uh, on a low level, this is what banks were designed for. This is the business case that they came in. They, they said, okay, well, hang on. Uh, I can collect everybody's money, and then I can also help out somebody by loaning them money. Um, and that's kind of like a, a virtuous thing for society because it allows you to make bigger purchases than your paycheck every day allows, okay? And so banks have kind of wandered away from this. They don't really, they do do this now, but like you saw with the rapid save, they're not really too concerned with collecting your money and that 0.5%, that's incentivizing you. That's supposed to get you to want to leave your money with them. Um, but they're not really trying that hard because they make most of their money elsewhere doing other things. Okay, so, but basically this is what, uh, um, the low level function of the bank is. And so to incentivize these people, they get paid interest. And a good experiment, not experiment, a good uh, source of dinner conversation when, when you're next on FaceTime with your folks, ask them, you know, when they were younger, what interest the banks paid. And then have a quick comparison with 0.5% at um, whatever BNZ that bank was, okay? So that's my diagram, that goes here. That's where, that's what, what banks do, okay? Uh, in terms of, of DeFi, well, how do we do this if it's, if it's decentralized? So if we wanna take this diagram and turn it into something that's decentralized, the first thing we need to do is make sure that um, we don't have to have anybody pull in the pull in the strings. There's no manager, okay? Um, there's nobody setting, uh, there's nobody, I should say, there's nobody changing uh, the interest rates. There's nobody looking at your application and saying, oh, actually, uh, I'm not sure that, that this is a good fit. And, you know, maybe they've, they've got some, uh, they've got some bias against the customer or something like that. So there shouldn't, shouldn't be any of this. Um, but this idea of depositing money and then withdrawing it and loaning it to someone else, that's easy, right? So what we can have here is just to, we want it to be decentralized, we'll just deposit tokens, okay? That's it. We'll deposit tokens into some, well, where can we, where can we put them? Well, let's deposit them into, well, now we're going to call it a smart contract. Um, and that's just because that's what they're called, okay? It's not necessarily that it's a contract or that it's smart. That's just the name, right? Um, and we're going to do this all using code. And then what can we do? And then we can lend tokens to someone else. And you can do all of this using like a deposit and a withdraw function. Now you're going to have to have some checks in there, but that's fine. A couple of if else statements. 
check the balance, right? Uh, arrange some form of, of interest. So the way the banks get you is, um, aside from having a monopoly, they're going to incentivize with interest. Well, if you don't want to pay interest, what you can do is you can pay out tokens. So if you're running the contract or you're running a decentralized bank and you want people to come use your service, you can say, all right, um, I'll give you some tokens. I'm going to call them Jeff tokens. Um, and Jeff tokens can um, be resold on a secondary market and you can, you can earn some value. Or maybe Jeff tokens can be used to help you vote for stuff. Those are kind of the common use cases. Um, how else, what else can we do here? We can have fees for people that contribute to the system. That's a good thing. Okay, have fees, but you can also have fees that are low, like really, really low. So one of the, I'm looking for a car loan, one of the providers, well, all the providers have a, uh, have a loan fee, right? In order to get the documentation up and running, someone has to answer the phone and talk to you and put the numbers in the computer, they charge a fee. And one of them is charging $350 for a loan initialization fee. So straight away, your loan value goes up by $350. Well, the fees we're talking about on, are on the order of tens, tens of dollars right now. And in the future, you can imagine them being single dollars or fractions of dollars, uh, right? There's really no limit depending on uh, how creative you get. If you can have enough activity with low fees, so tens of dollars instead of maybe $3 sign instead of hundreds. Um, and so that's an area where DeFi does it better is through fees. Now you still have fees, but they're going to be much better. Now, another thing we can have here, I mentioned that Maybe the bank can't deny your application because they don't like you. Maybe there's some bias in there. They see your name. They assume where you're from. They assume, um, you know, your race or they assume your economic position. Um, and it might, it might not even be outright. It might be subtle. Um, but if it's DeFi all in a contract, you don't have to have KYC. You know what KYC means? Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah, so KYC is just an acronym, a business acronym for know your customer. Um, that means if I'm going to loan you money, uh, basically I better be darn sure you're going to pay it back. And so I want to I want to know what you spend your money on. I want to know what you own and what other debts you have, right? So I want to know all about you. And in the we were talking about data earlier. In the data sense, that means that the customer has to give up all their data to their provider. Okay, so uh, if it's decentralized, there's no KYC, so that's a bonus. Um, now, however, um, the way that DeFi loans are working right now is that loan collateral is high. So loan collateral is typically 150%. So, and that's just the way it is right now. So this means that if... Um, This means that if you want to borrow $1,000, okay, then you have to put up for collateral 150%. You have to put up $1,500. Now, that's a little bit backwards from the traditional banking system. You go to the bank, and because they have such a big global business, they can afford to loan you out $1,000 without only being assured of, say, 100 in deposits or something like that. So the fraction is the other way. Um, but if you have 150% collateral, you don't need to give up any data and you can still borrow money. Okay, so it doesn't mean that it doesn't work, it's just a different way of doing it. Um, and that's just right now. I think in the future that will come down with different products lowering that. Okay, so interest and loans, these are uh, a base level financial activity and it can be implemented pretty easily into a smart contract. So you don't have to read these details, they're not important, but here's how this would work. Here's how a flash loan uh, is initiated by this product called DYDX. You may remember from calculus class, DYDX is a first derivative. Uh, so that's the name of, of their company or uh, of their product. 
but you can see here, step one, withdraw, step two, call function, step three, deposit back. Now a flash loan is a special type of loan, um, but basically the action is the same and it doesn't take much code. There is more to it than this, um, and we'll go look at an example, but it's, uh, it's not super complicated. Now, I bet if you were to dig into uh, some loan provider's back end uh, in terms of how they like run a credit check and assess your uh, assess your loan viability, that it would be very, very complicated uh, in the back end. I've heard that banking systems generally are horrendous. Um, if any of you know anyone that works in like bank IT, um, again, I, the, I've just heard that they're horrendous because as soon as you have a good system, or as soon as you have a system that works, you don't want to do anything that could break it. And you just try to leave the system. So if your bank has been running, some banks run software that was written in like the 1960s because, because nowadays nobody can update it because nobody learns software that's that old and they don't want to touch it because if they break it, that could be a big problem for them. Anyways, uh, the code for some of these DeFi products is uh, remarkably succinct. And part of that is because it has to be um, in order to push it out to the Ethereum network. Okay, we'll come back and look at uh, some more code in a second. Okay, so that was loans. What about markets? So how can we, how can we do this? So let's just run through a market example. Um, so a financial product is uh, the ability to trade one asset or to trade um, one currency for another. Uh, so the NZX, the New Zealand Stock Exchange, uh, the, have you guys heard about the problems they've had? They've had extreme DDoS attacks lately. They've been shut down, I think, two weeks ago. It was four days in a row or something. And then they were continued to be attacked. And last week they launched a second entire site. So they migrated. I don't know if they migrated or did a copy of the NZX from one I guess, uh, entire hosting system to another um, because of all these DDoS attacks. Anyways, the NZX is a brokerage, okay? So there's also this uh, fairly popular Sharesies, fairly popular New Zealand company called Sharesies, um, which is also a brokerage. So the NZX fits into this. And so all a broker does is hold some asset for you and then find someone to take the other side of that deal. So if I want to buy some shares in Kathmandu because I think their products are always on sale and they're great, I'm going to send some money to Sharesies. Sharesies holds my $100 and then Sharesies on the other side goes and finds some shares of Kathmandu to buy. Okay, so there's two bits here. I give Sharesies money, Sharesies then goes and buys some shares for me and then assigns them you know, to my account. But there's two steps in there. And the middle step is that brokerage step. Now, Sharesies might not be able to find, um, if everybody wants Kathmandu and nobody's willing to sell me some, then they're going to have to charge a bit more. So the price might go up. And this is gonna happen at the brokerage. The price could go up, it could also go down, uh, depending on what's available. So that's what a stock exchange does, is they are a large aggregator and if they have popular shares like um, Fonterra that are bought and sold every single day, then what they do is they hold a pool of those shares they don't have to, so that they don't have to go looking for someone to um, buy some Fonterra shares to then sell to the next person. They'll just hold some, uh, and as a big um, aggregator, they can do that. So that's, that's kind of how uh, currency markets kind of work the, the same way. Um, where somebody's going to hold a large pool of US dollars and then offer to sell you some at a set rate and then sell someone else. And then they know that they're big enough. Somebody else is going to come in and sell them some of those US dollars to refill the pool. But if you're trying to buy something really obscure, like a, like a Russian ruble, um, I don't even think you can buy Russian rubles, but if you wanted to buy a much more, a much smaller currency, then it's going to be harder for the brokerage and they'll charge you a bigger fee to go find some rubles for you. Okay, so how does how does DeFi do this? Well, this is 
probably the number one use case of DeFi, such that it's a bit boring now because it's been around a while. Um, but let's see here. We're going to, well, we can deposit tokens uh, into a contract. And we can think of this as like a pool that I just mentioned. Uh, and then when someone wants to buy some, they just withdraw the tokens from the pool. Uh, and so instead of having an entire brokerage in the middle, instead of having sharesies, uh, which has to hire employees and has to pay licensing fees and has to um, have audits on their accounts and everything like this, you can have the whole thing done in a single contract that's run de decentrally, decentral in a decentralized manner. Um, now there is a little bit of risk here because what if you want to withdraw tokens from the pool and you can't, or what if the pool gets locked or gets hacked or something like this? So there is a bit of risk, but there's also risk with the bank or with sharesies. So what are some of the benefits here? Well, it eliminates the broker. What else does it eliminate? It eliminates borders. So if you want to buy some, so I'm from Canada, and if I wanted to buy some shares from a Canadian company, right, I would need to have an account with a Canadian broker. I can't go to the New Zealand Stock Exchange and buy shares in Canada. Um, so Decentralized really is decentralized in this sense that you can buy stuff across borders. It's really easy, right? Because the people in Canada are also connected to the internet and that's all we need in order to be able to um, make this exchange. So there's less friction uh, in that way. Now, why would people want to deposit their tokens or their shares or their currency? Um, well, they're going to be incentivized by fees, same as always. Just, just like these people that want 0.5%, you're going to be incentivized by fees, and hopefully those fees are, are good, <laughs> good compared to bank fees, right? And presently, they, they are. So we're talking 10% approximately right now. Um, there are services that have less and services that have more, but that's a lot more than your bank will be offering you. Um, so there's a problem here I mentioned if you want to get rubles which are a little bit which are not as popular as US dollars the price might go up. Well you have the same thing if you want to buy shares or you want to buy some other token. Um, if it's not as popular there's not going to be uh, as many people willing to buy and sell at the same time so this is called liquidity and in order to get uh, in order to get people to basically bootstrap the protocol, what is happening is that people are being offered incentives for adding liquidity. So liquidity providers are also being paid fees. And you can, uh, one of the reasons why the banks are so popular, like ANZ and B, ASB, is that the banks charge fees and keep them to themselves. So the banks will charge you 200 bucks to take a loan and keep that $200 to themselves. But in a decentralized protocol, there's no, there's no themselves to keep it, right? Um, and so what you can actually do is you can distribute fees to everyone in the system. And that one deserves to be highlighted. You don't have to, but because you're writing the code for this and you can be as creative as you want, uh, you can distribute fees and then someone else can read the code and say, hey, that's a good deal. Um, and they know that they're not getting ripped off. They know that there's not like a back-end account that's actually siphoning off the fees because you can see the code uh, and you can distribute fees to everyone. And so th this is uh, a big benefit. I got one more point here about markets um, and that is that you can have an algorithm determine things like fees and liquidity. 
Now, this isn't much different from how a, a, a banking or insurance company would do it. They're going to use an algorithm to determine um, these things as well. But the difference is that at the bank, it's a black box, and you can't see what's happening behind the scenes. But in a decentralized protocol, you can get in there and read what's happening. Now, you may not be able to read code, or you may not be that great at understanding how the code gets transferred into a product, uh, into a use case. But you, just knowing that it's there actually makes the psychology a lot better because that means that somebody else also can look at it. And um, just like just like products by word of mouth sell a lot better, if, if a lot of people look at the code and audit it and say that it's good and it's worthy, then that helps the customers that maybe aren't so technical as well. So it helps bring them on board. So these examples for interest and loans and then for markets are two really popular and useful ones in DeFi right now. So here's a code for a protocol called Uniswap. Uh, and again, this isn't all of it, but this is one function and it's pretty straightforward. You have an address about your account, an address two, how many tokens, okay? How many tokens in? What are the minimum tokens out? Uh, the function is going to return a number, so you're going token to token. So you want to transfer from rubles to dollars. Same thing, token to token. Um, and you're going to return uh, an amount. You're going to call another function here. Um, but again, you can go look at this. Uniswap, uh, Uniswap is taking in a lot of money in fees right now. A lot of people are using it. And you can actually go look at the code, which you can't do. You can't go look at Amazon and find out the algorithm for why they're always recommending you, know, you to buy X or Y. Um, but you can if it's decentralized. So maybe we'll just go have a look here. So here's the Uniswap repo. Okay, so there's three main contracts. ERC20, that's a Ethereum token, so Uniswap runs on the Ethereum network. I have a token factory and then a pairing. So if we look at the token factory, again, we're not going to read it, but look how small this is. It's 49 lines of code. And if we look at the ERC one, it's a bit bigger, 94 lines. Now this is un uncommented, so gives you an idea. And then look at the pairing here, 200 lines, okay? And that, in essence, it is the whole thing. Now it's not the front end, that's just the end running on the blockchain. And it's all there, right? If you wanted to, I mean, I presume you guys know how GitHub works, but I can copy this code or I can, where is my fork button? I can just fork it, right? So you can copy the protocol and start your own. And of course that has happened. And I'll talk about an example of that in a second. So that's the code, there's not very much to it. Let's have a look at the contract deployment. So we'll talk more about contracts in the coming weeks. Um, oh, and it actually lists the source code here. Um, and we can see all sorts of details about it here. We can see the contract all the way down to the bytecode. And we can see all of the interactions with the contract. So we have a bunch of transactions that are pending, so they haven't even been picked up yet. And that is because it's really popular right now. There's more than 25 pending. So this is ongoing. People are using this um, presently. Uh, and this provider Etherscan has nothing to do with Uniswap. Um, they're not in partnership or anything. All they're doing is displaying the details of this contract address. So here's some DeFi products. 
Uh, 0x is a peer-to-peer -peer exchange. So exchanges have been around for a little while. Um, Peer-to-peer -peer means that there's no independent company in the middle that you have to send your shares or your money to. Okay, uh, It means that you're just trading with other people that want to trade, and it uses what's called an order book. So 0x holds the order book, and then you interact with it. Uh, but the whole thing is run in a decentralized fashion on the blockchain. Uh, Bancor and Uniswap, they run liquidity pools where people deposit contract or people deposit tokens. And if you leave your tokens there, you can earn a fee. Um, and then if you use Uniswap, which the idea is to actually swap between tokens, if you use it, then you pay a fee. So you got a back and forth fees there. Kyber Network is a reserve aggregator. Um, so they're going in and they're trying to look for the difference um, between different pools and they only have a limited number of tokens in their pool, uh, in, their, in their reserve. AirSwap is another peer-to-peer over-the-counter type product where um, you don't have an order book but you just negotiate with other people. So you say, hey, I've got 10 of Katmandu. Um, I'm willing to sell for 30, who's willing to buy for 30? Whereas at 0x, that order goes into the book. Uh, and Compound is a savings and savings and loan, so just like my bank on the board here. And they use an oracle to determine how much that token is worth. So an oracle is something that has to reach out of the blockchain, talk to the real world, and get some data. So this site here, DeFi Pulse, has a big listing of products, and these are just the lending products. Here's a bunch of trading products, and so you can get an idea for all the different products. So this stuff moves really fast. A lot of things, a lot of um, applications in blockchain move really fast, and the reason is because you can just go to GitHub if they have published their code, you can just go fork the code and write your own. Uh, and if yours is better, and you can incentivize people to move over to your product, then, then they're going to use that. So that's just give you an idea of what's out there. OK, so to finish up, a cautionary tale. So we trust the banks because they've been around for a while. Um, and they're at least not going to, they're at least going to give us back the same money we put in. Um, although with negative interest rates on the horizon, that, that might change, maybe not for common civilians, but for bigger depositors. So here is an emoji for a yam or a kumra, right? So yam finance, they came up and they did a fork of Uniswap, which is what I just showed you, um, only they changed it a bit, right? So if you're the fork code, you should change it and try to make it better or try to do something different with it. So they said that they're going to introduce these YAM tokens, Y-A-M, and these tokens are going to have an elastic supply, which means the supply can increase if it needs to or it can decrease if it needs to. Um, the YAM token was going to be used to incentivize people. So they said, hey, if you come use our protocol, I'll give you some yams. And then also, if you have yams, you can use to vote on what happens next with the project. OK, so that's what governance means. It just means voting on what happens. So an example of voting would be, hey, we have uh, a million tokens in the yam treasury. How should, we f how should we distribute them? And you might choose to, as a community, you might choose to send 100,000 yam tokens to some developer that's going to help build your product. Maybe you're going to send some to somebody that's going to build the front end, right? Things like this. Um, and so then that person can get paid in YAM tokens. Um, and then maybe those tokens, they can sell them and actually turn into uh, money that they can use. So what happened? In two days, this was just a couple weeks ago. Uh, this was in late August. In two days, it went from zero to 580 million, which meant AUM is assets under management. So that meant that people were sending them their, uh, their money or their tokens to lock up and try to earn some yams. And then it went back down to zero. And this all happened in two days, right? So really fast. Uh, so the token price, 
went from zero to $167 per yam, and then it went back down to 14, so the crash happened in six hours. Uh, and then a short time later, like uh, something like 12 hours later, it went down to less than a dollar. So people were earning money, not money, they were earning yams, and they thought for a moment that they were rich because of all the yams that they had, okay? And some people, unfortunately, were even buying yams. So if you didn't have any assets locked up in the protocol, you could still go to an exchange and purchase yams, right, from someone else, go to a market and buy them. So those people that bought the yams, they lost all their money. Uh, so a short time later, it was worth less than a dollar. And why? Well, a one-line bug in the smart contract prevented governance proposals from being possible. Okay, so the, the protocol basically worked, except they promised the idea of using yams for governance. And this bug, what they did was they forgot to normalize the votes. So they were adding up all the votes, and they forgot to divide by the total, which would then make the vote um, be a fraction so that the majority could be reached. Um, and that was it, just a one-line bug. And as soon as people found out about it, it crashed, right? As soon as people lose faith, they're going to withdraw their money, they're going to sell their yams, they're gone. You saw the list. There's a hundred other protocols out there. Uh, so that's just a link to the story. So here's the chart. This is on CoinGecko, and you can see there the peak, 160 for the token. Uh, and then, you know, this is 13th August, one day later, it was at zero. So if you were buying yams or holding yams, you know, and then you went away for a day or you didn't check Twitter that day, uh, you came back and your yams were worthless. So you lost your money. Uh, so there is risk involved with these things. Um, and that's because everything's moving so fast. People are publishing things without being audited. Um, that's a whole other topic is auditing smart contracts. So now when you go to the website, they've launched the YAM V2. Uh, and now there's this warning. We strongly urge caution to anyone who chooses to engage with these contracts. Okay, so in summary for DeFi, this is this is my summary diagram that I put together here. So we've got the banks, right? They've got they've got all your money, uh, and they they've got so much profit that all this profit is being drained into a decentralized network. So if this bag of money is yours, first of all, congratulations for having a bag of money. Um, but when you withdraw it from the bank and you deposit it into the centralized protocol, right? That is funds leaving the centralized system and going into the decentralized system. And of course, there's a finite amount of funds. If everybody from the bank did this, or if, all the, or if a large fraction of depositors at the bank started doing this, then you're going to have a real change in the financial system.